my main contribution to all this is about every oh, three months they say executive board. I want some of these damn ships going down. We want disaster. I, 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 I know you did. I want disaster. <laughs> damn it, things break. They don't work right. Things so, blow no, I'm up. I'm saying it's because I'm a storyteller myself. The natural tendency of a storyteller is to make things better. Look. It is. It's the uh, but yeah, I'm not like that. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. I love to break things. Well, yeah. well um, which of course was why I came up with the St. Philip stuff so that I could have industrial accident after industrial accident for the society to, of St. Philip to uh, investigate. So yeah, but the other point actually... Oh, so you call in the exorcist. <laughs> oh, no! <laughs> <laughs> Get behind me, Murphy. <laughs> I want to make a point earlier in regard to what Tim was raising. There's another phenomenon, which is that once an industry gets widespread enough, a whole infrastructure, it's actually what Chuck was talking about. You get an infrastructure <laughs> built up around that industry. Once that happens, there's an enormous amount of inertia that makes it hard to shift away from that industry, even if abstractly something better. Um, it's the reason why it's going to be very hard to move away from gasoline engines because whatever their problems may be, within every four blocks you drive in a city, there's a gas station. And whereas if you're going to talk about replacing something else, it's one of the problems they have assuming they can develop a hydrogen fuel cell is, well, that's fine. Where do you, you know... Where's the f hydrogen where's station? The, you're right. Where's the hydrogen station? They don't have it. And, and building that network, it's a, it exists now for gasoline. Now the point is that once, if you start with a world like 1632, where there are reasons that lighter than air travel becomes much more prominent, much more widespread than it did in ours, then there will actually be an inertia to keep it going, even once it becomes easier to do heavier than air. You'll probably still keep yep. seeing lighter than air lasting a long, it's, long time. They're actually bringing it back. My father, it's got a good niche. Okay. It's, got, it's got a good niche. There are going to be some people who are going to take the plane because it's even faster than the light. It's always the what plane are, is always faster. Well, can you define that as part of the perversity, the the sheer inertia of bureaucracy that develops around the technology? And you know, I mean, that would be would well, but it's not just. But no, no, that's one phenomenon which is vested interest. I, and I did work for Lockheed. <laughs> if anyone wants to know who the biggest welfare queen is in the United States, I work for them. And I can describe to you as a machinist in great detail, if you want to listen to it, exactly how on a day-to-day -day basis Lockheed screws the American taxpayer. Yeah, yeah. Every time, every minute. And it's not, it's legal. It's all perfectly legal. But anyway, that's not what I'm talking about. I'm not talking about institutional inertia. I'm talking about the inertia of the customer. The average person driving a car mm -hmm. is not going to switch over, for instance, to an electric car. Prius is a royal really pain in the butt. To and they make the money. And they got to they gotta find a <laughs> I remember that's I bought sales, one of the first sales. BWs when they first came in, in the, the United bugs. States. And it was a pain in the ass if you weren't a mechanic yourself, which I wasn't trying to find a mechanic who would repair it. I, I can remember having my VW bug break down in Idaho and coming to a small town and trying to get a mechanic and they would just look at that thing and say, I, I don't I don't do that. I don't do these more. Cars. Cars are good example there, there are also issues the there are also issues of, if you will, a kind of it's a kind of an industrial pyramid and an expertise pyramid effect. Not everybody can undertake all kinds of projects. How many places, how many countries in the world can and can afford to and have a reason to operate airports? Okay, fine. How many can actually build something as simple as a Piper Cub? Actually, a surprising number. <laughs> how many can build a pretty good large-sized passenger aircraft? A DC-3. Yeah. How many can build a huge passenger aircraft? Apparently, even consortiums have a hard time with it, um, if you know the story of Airbus recently. Uh, <laughs> how many can actually build a rocketry program? And then you have to ask, we're not talking anymore about sounding rockets, low Earth orbit access, et cetera. We're talking punch out to geosync and beyond. And the number shrinks. And then you start taking, you look at how much does it cost? What are the expertises needed? There is so much infrastructure in, in, in essence that needs to be in place in addition to it, in addition to this objective before it's pursued, to make the objective possible. If you, okay, I can do it, I got the engineers for it. Yeah, do you have the computer programmers? 
Well, we can really have him cross it. Don't come back and talk to me later. Now, tell me when you've got that society. One of the reasons I bring this up is I think that, that there's going to be, a, to follow up what Gord was saying, an, an interesting effect, which is I do suspect that the downtimers will stay with hotter than air for a Long. longer period of time, more locally, because it can be done. It is one of the reasons it's so inefficient, by the way, is your lift costs your fuel. Yeah. And that is the immense part of your payload. Right. You burn three times as, uh, something like three or four times as much mass of fuel as you actually deliver to site. The moment you've got helium or lighter than air, literally a lighter than air gas in there, now your fuel is propulsion. And that's that's a whole different ball of wax. Well, because of that, just, uh, just to wrap up, how many places are going to be able to make the hydrogen industry and support it and in enough and enough amount, it's going to be a lot easier, a lot longer at the local level mm -hmm. to do I the hot al is. Also, in the in the development sequence that Chuck's described, with that idea of the hot air dirig semi rigid dirigible that's going to go seventy to a hundred miles in a day, and so. You've got that, you know, he said, take the map of Europe, start drawing lines between towns with your compass set it. Google set Earth, it. you can do yeah. it, Google right. Earth. But, but the point is, <laughs> that's how I did it. And start drawing lines and drawing you the just network, take a little okay? Line thing now, from here to here. remember oh, wow. that in our world, the railroads were all built long before <clears throat> the first dirigibles came into being, right? <coughs> but downtime. In the 1632 universe, the number of miles of railroad are minuscule. Compared. And even using the Patiala tramway technique, which has half the less than half the requirement for steel, even using that, your infrastructure cost for building a mile of that rail is incredibly high. Let and you high. have to maintain so, it. On well, and, and that doesn't even so get into land use or who owns it or He will have legal. a network of dirigible fields and dirigible supply points and dirigible freight warehouses and dirigible scheduling agents scattered all across Europe before we've got a thousand miles of railroad. That's right. Well, remember the very best distance rail by hand built rail ever created was 11 miles in one day and that was that was in the race between the union pacific and the, uh, the transcon the, and, and the central pacific on the first transcontinental we have a and question back there yeah couldn't we expect to see a, a larger buildup of variables in areas that have um, more efficient fuels such as oil coal Possibly timers with <laughs> fuel, fuel really doesn't, well, okay, fuel matters for ICEs, but I'm a steam proponent, and they don't care what you're burning fuel. I've got an idea for a story where I want to sail my airship around town burning bacon fat to make them hungry to go to my wife. <laughs> <laughs> I told you no! I told you <laughs> um, Yeah, well, as somebody like mentioned the other day, every tree in Germany has a name. Yes. yes. What are you going to burn? Coal. Yeah. Coal. Oil. Coal, coal and oil. Okay. Well, you Butter. Have to produce yeah. heat. Well, you've you've got, got to that's... move directly to coal and oil. Do you, you, you remember? To burn wood. I have a... Do you remember how earlier on we were saying one of the books is going to the Caribbean? Mm -hmm. you, you, you ever looked at it? <laughs> so, yeah. so your point, very well taken. And then he not not, not taken. It, it's it's not out there in a vacuum. Check very the nice. I've got Tony's agreement. To, we haven't got the contract yet, but it, they will be. Working title is Commander Cantrell in the West Indies. <laughs> <laughs> and, and the wait a minute, wait a minute. You know? You're burning <laughs> rum? <laughs> no, actually, Trinidad has a yeah. sizable oil reserve. I know. And and they they have, right now, Trinidad has yeah. one of the largest yeah. operating oil Yeah, but at some point, it's going to have gantry, to without a run right the sequence. Where, remember, we got to have things go wrong. And of all of the authors that I've ever had the pleasure of beta reading for, this man enjoys writing things that go wrong. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> you know? I, I mean, when the very first thing you ever sent me, my response to you was, would they really do that? And you went, oh, yeah. So, <laughs> um, so, so um, you know, he's going to. 
I ju inevitably you're going to have the you're going to have the guys who end up burning sugar cane. You know, I mean. Well, they'll be. Yeah, I, <laughs> well, no, they do that. Already. All right, oh. I have I have a comment. I think in all this technology, the biggest problem you're going to have is the technophobe. Um, I, I graduated from college before the personal computer, so I have a whole group of my friends who have been for 20 years or 30 years afraid to touch a computer because it was just too much to absorb. So I don't think that there are going to be a lot of downtimers who are going to jump onto the technology thing. They are going to avoid it but, but, in a religious fashion. But, but the teenagers <laughs> won't. That's true. Yeah. I agree. And the next generation is going to be hot <laughs> for it. The problem, the problem there is your friends have the luxury of ignoring it. If it's in, there, in and the it's milieu faster, that we're they, talking they about here, if you don't compete, you don't eat. Yeah. It's also, a, it's also <laughs> a, a cultural thing. I mean, it is. One of the things that struck me: the last real job I had was working in a machine <laughs> shop in where I lived, Northwest Indiana, mid nineties. And I myself didn't, being a technophobe, I didn't get a computer until I decided to go back to writing in nineteen. And the only reason I did it was because I didn't they weren't really selling. want the gadget, but on the other hand, because I had written in times past, I knew exactly how much of a pain in the ass it They were no longer type selling typewriters. Well, even if I had one, I knew what a pain in the ass typewriters were. Correct. Yeah. Okay. Um, you know, so I figured I would, I would force myself to learn how to do the word processor program. Um, but what struck me in that machine shop, this is a solid... Northwest Indiana blue collar population. I, I, I'm sure I was the only one there. I know I was the only one there who had a college degree, uh, which I did not tell my boss because he would have hired me if he had it. Yeah, sure. Uh, uh, yeah, right. I was over, you know, he was, what the hell are you doing here? Uh, <laughs> and, you know, it's hard to explain it. Well, for I'm me, earning a living. With my political history, never mind. But the point is, I'm, I'm 50 and this is a trade I now don't know how to do. So. Anyway, forget all that. But it was striking to me how many of those guys, including men my age or older, love computers, had them. One guy I worked with was doing all kinds of fancy graphic stuff. Every time a new computer came out, he not only buy it, he learned how the damn thing worked and the logic of it. So, you know, it's kind of funny. It partly depends on, on this is a population that's used to working with gadgetry. I mean, you know. They do it all the time. They're mechanical their own yeah. cars since they were two, you know. And the computers are kind of approaching the same way. So I think you're going to get subcultures of a population that are going to do much the same kind of thing. They'll jump all over it. And it doesn't honestly matter that much. Even to this day, they just, somebody just did a, I read this study about a year and a half ago. The big majority of Americans, most Americans I have a computer, use it to play games and email. Because they're bored, and that's it. Honestly. They have nothing else to do. Yeah. They, they when 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 it gets nighttime, what are you gonna do? There's well, nothing on TV. Got something <laughs> interesting. It's become, yeah. It's yeah. Actually, it I, I don't know if anybody's done a study of, but I'm willing to bet it's actually been time has been shifted. What people are complaining that well, we're no longer social anymore because everybody glued their own computer. I think those same amount of time used to be spent glued watching a TV screen. Yeah, so we still were not you know, so. You might have been sitting next to your old lady, but I mean, you know, you weren't talking, you were just watching, you know, whatever was on a boot. Yeah. Yeah. One of the favorite moments in, in the series was when the French came up with uh, percussion caps when the Grandfell <laughs> folks did. That was, that was a, a nice piece of writing. 